not it's not sustainable right now okay so here's what we're gonna do I gotta get through this lesson as long as the audio is fine I hope that's okay um, let me step out so I'm in the frame as long as the audio is fine I think that's okay for now I'm actually gonna go out to the store and figure something out for the Wi-Fi right after the stream so I'm gonna go out get whatever converter uh, I need for my laptop to be able to connect the Ethernet cable and I'm gonna have it connected and ready for the next stream which should be happening sometime around one o'clock so stay tuned for better quality but let's finish up this lecture all right so there are two types of founders and thank you for the feedback guys artisans and opportunistic founders right so artisan founders and and here once again there isn't a better or a worse it's all about accurately identifying which one you belong in, right? So if you are an artisan founder, you tend to be paternalistic with your ideas, right? You tend to be reluctant to delegate. Reluctant to delegate. You tend to look for few sources of funding. Right, so you have a strong preference for building something quickly sustainable or having a very large amount of money come from a single source or whatever it is, but something that's quickly sustainable. Let me see, maybe my phone is on the Wi-Fi? No, it's not. Huh. All right, well, I'm sorry about that, guys, but this will have to do for now, and, and we'll fix it today, so stay tuned. And shorter time orientation. Shorter time orientation. The other side of it is an opportunistic founder. So an opportunistic founder avoids being paternalistic. Right? In general, they tend to manage hands off from a distance. They delegate all of the work that they can really because they understand that's important for growth. They tend to look for multiple sources of funding because they need it for longer due to a long-term perspective. Now, these aren't, I mean, some kind of rules that we've discovered that people belong either in this category or in this category, right? The way to imagine it is you exist somewhere on a spectrum from paternalistic to not paternalistic, from delegating to not delegating, from having few sources of funding to multiple sources of funding and from short to long-term time orientation. And so what you need to try to figure out about yourself is where you fall on these so that you can quickly align your actions with the way that you function best. That's what's important. There's no best way for a business, right? I mean, uh, Steve Jobs was an artisan founder, right? Uh, he just was because he, he delegated control of, of basically as little as he could and almost no control towards the end and final decisions, right? So, um, and he, he looks for as few sources of funding as possible, right? Reluctant to IPO, and then Apple has still never given up its cash ever since because they don't like to borrow money, right? And that's something that's infused into the company, right? He did, however, have a very long-term perspective, right? And that made him very, very interesting in terms of the way things worked out. So you need to figure out where you fall on this spectrum so that you can align the mission of your company, the way that you delegate, the way that you work, and so that you can inform your employees more directly about the kind of the kind of person that you are, right? That's very important. So that's where we're at with artisans and opportunistic founders. So you'll see a lot of entrepreneurship, a lot of self self employment is really self discovery, right? It's really finding out about yourself and being able to uh, being able to inform others. So one of the things, one of the trends that's upsetting is women face discrimination. And this happens, discrimination. I will never learn to spell correctly. I'm just not, that's not something I'm ever going to work on. We're just going to keep spelling things as though, as though they don't, you know, I'll put an E and an I there. I don't actually know which one it is, but I think it's an E because it's like described. I don't know. Point is, Women face discrimination, and they face discrimination in a couple of ways, right? So first, they have difficulty securing financing. 
securing finance. Right? And this is mostly because a lot of people on, on Wall Street, a lot of people in big banks, a lot of people in those kinds of situations tend to be sexist. And, and, that's, and that's just a reality that, that unfortunately we currently have to live with. And, and there hasn't really been much effort to change that. I think companies are doing so individually because they're seeing an ongoing pressure from their employees and so on and so forth. And hopefully this will change in the future. But right now, women face discrimination in securing funding, right? Furthermore, in male-dominated industries, think something like um, construction or, I don't know, construction is one that comes to mind, right? Although I've, I've been seeing a lot more a lot more women working in construction. I don't know about owning construction companies because I haven't really looked into that, but they have trouble networking in these boys clubs, right? So all the construction people that give each other jobs for building these new developments and so on and so forth all go out and they play golf and they you know, complain about their wives and so on and so forth. And so it's difficult if you're a woman to go ahead and join one of those groups because there's less to connect them, right? What we're seeing is actually we're seeing women actively building their own networking groups. Now, whether or not that's that's better or worse, I, I, I don't actually know, but it is really good in terms of support because that is very important. Networking and the people that you know will get you very far in business. Um, and then finally, they're expected, just, just due to our perception of gender, role, gender roles, they're expected to juggle their life, life, family, and career, especially if they're a small business owner or a business owner. Right? They're expected to still devote enough time to their family, to their husband, to their kids, to all of that, and their business career, right? And so, I mean, this is, this is silly because I think both people, I mean, outside of like breastfeeding, both people in the family are, are able to, to contribute in a meaningful way. Right, and I think I think that family structure idea is changing the fastest. So, this is the one with the most change and the most change coming up quickly. Is these support groups, these networking groups that are designed specifically for women. Right. This is the second thing that's probably on the rise. Right. This is the second thing that's been kind of put away for the most part because I think mostly men of 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 the younger generations are, are more comfortable not being you know, not being, oh, you know, I'm the man of the family, because the reality is we just depend on two incomes nowadays. That's just how it is, right? And then securing financing will probably be the third to go, and it'll probably be some kind of sweeping uh, either regulation or enforcement standard that people collect, um, that lenders collect the gender of who they're lending to, or perhaps what we'll see is more anonymization. Anonymization, right? So, when you apply for a loan, you currently apply with your name and your phone number and your address and all of those things. And although you may not want it to, although you may not want it to, although your loan officer may not want to do this, right, intentionally or consciously, they're going to be making judgments as they're reading your application, right? So if you live in a bad neighborhood in your state, they're going to make a judgment. If you are a woman or a man, they're going to make a judgment. If you have a long last name that's difficult to pronounce, they're going to make a judgment. But all of those things aren't actually good qualifiers for a loan, right? If I'm thinking about giving you a loan, what your name is doesn't really matter. What matters is are you able to make more money than I'm lending you, right? So what we might see is we might see further anonymization in the approval process, or we might see more automation in the approval process, right? So we might put it, machines more in charge of the approval process and, and hopefully, therefore, create greater equality. Right. But my, my point is, all three of these things are completely nonsensical. There's not, I mean, women aren't actually any worse at, at networking or any worse at juggling their life or any worse at, at securing loans. It just so happens that the society we live in puts them in that situation. And unfortunately, this is the case today and hopefully something that, you know, by the time, um, by the time my kids grow up will be, will be very, very different. So, the next thing I want to talk about is entrepreneurial teams. Entrepreneurial teams. Now, this is a topic that, that the book doesn't really go into very much. Um, the textbook doesn't really go into very much. And, 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 you know, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on it. But what I will say is I have experienced both the solo 
and the team found it. Right. And I will say the following. The solo founding is difficult, right? When you're by yourself, you are subject more than anything to a lot of your own biases, a lot of your own ways of thinking. So if you're a generally very optimistic person, you're going to be overly optimistic. If you're a generally very pessimistic person, you're going to be very pessimistic, right? So as a team, I've actually had the opportunity to work with someone that I've known my whole life. And I will say that it, it, it was an absolutely incredible experience because you balance each other out, right? We just so happen to have kind of like a yin and yang going, right? Where his, his own understanding or his own perspective on the world was, was not radically different from mine, but just balanced me out. So where I was optimistic, he was more pessimistic. Um, where I was being more realistic, he would be more in a fantasy world, right? Like where I was being more in a fantasy world, he would be more realistic. And, and this was a conscious effort on both our parts. So if you're picking a partner to go into business with, to run a business with, even to hire to work directly with you or directly under you or whatever it is, try to have a good understanding of your skills. Because if you have a good understanding of your skills, you'll be able to balance them out. And if you're able to balance them out, your opportunity and your chances of success go up drastically. All right, next step. So, the next thing are key elements of successful ventures. Right? So successful ventures share some key elements and obviously any rules that are rules are meant to be broken, right? So, but successful ventures focus on customers. Focus on customers. I can tell you an anecdote from my life that, that happened just recently, right? So um, I have a baby, and therefore we have a baby monitor. Uh, we have a baby monitor. So what we do is we put the baby monitor in the baby's room, and, and the little monitor stays in our room so we can hear him crying or waking up or whatever. The baby monitor broke. And we called at 11.30 at night. We called this company, and we said, hey, our baby monitor broke. Not only did someone pick up and try to troubleshoot it with us and then said, hey, just send us an email and we'll send you out a new one come Tuesday morning, right? This is on a Sunday night, right at 11.30 that we call it. Somebody picked up. You know why? Because that company isn't selling baby monitors. That company is selling peace of mind. And they understand that their customer service is another opportunity to reinforce in our minds that they're selling peace of mind. And I won't go to another company from now on because... I know that they put peace of mind first, not their product, not their profit margins, not anything else. They put my peace of mind first as a parent, and therefore, they're very important. So your focus on your customers has to be, has to permeate throughout your organization. It's not enough to put on a mission. We focus on our customers, and we like them very much. That doesn't, that doesn't fucking do anything, okay? Nothing. The next thing is the quality of your product. And here... Quality doesn't mean that you use the finest ingredients from all over the planet and all of that stuff. The quality actually refers to something called consistency. Consistency, right? Customers come to expect consistency in your product and in your service. So if you work very hard to create a consistent product and you create one, that's great. If you don't, however... Then, and your quality varies, even if it's slightly increasing over time on a general trend, your customers will be wary of buying your product because they don't know. I mean, this week, if I go to the supermarket and I buy the cream cheese, it might be more runny, it might be more solid, it might be this, it might be that. Those of you that tried Chobani yogurt before Chobani became big and, and everything, it was a very soupy, runny, lots of whey yogurt. And, and they mastered it over time, right? And now they've mastered product consistency. So... At the beginning, it's okay for your quality to shift and so on and so forth, but expect to lose money or at least spend more money than you're making in the beginning because you are trying to achieve consistency, right? A famous example of consistency is, of course, McDonald's. If you go anywhere in the world and you buy chicken nuggets, they taste like chicken nuggets. Um, the third thing is integrity and responsibility. Integrity and responsibility. And this is an important distinction 
uh, when you're thinking responsibility, when you're thinking as well, right? This is an important distinction when you're thinking as well. Integrity refers to your business's values, right? Your business's values. And it, it takes a very long time for business to understand and appreciate it for your customers to see it. Responsibility is a little bit different. So responsibility, people tend to tie into being at fault. Well, if it's my fault, then it's my responsibility. Here's an example that I read recently that really clarifies why those two things are completely different. If you wake up one morning and you open the door and, and in front of your door is a little basket with a little baby in it, is it your fault? No, it's not your fault. You, could, you couldn't have done anything. It's just, it's just there. But is it your responsibility? Yes, of course it's your responsibility. The baby's right there. You have to do something. Right? Even if you choose to do nothing with it, you've chosen to do something. So your responsibility stems from being in the right position at the right time to make a decision. Right? And oftentimes, your company, depending on how deeply and how closely you affect individuals, you will be there and you will be responsible for something that is not your fault. That is not your fault. Right? It doesn't have to be your fault, but you will still be responsible. And finally... You want to be driving for innovation, right? The other piece of it is globalization, but I think at the point where you're considering globalization, you've pretty much nailed everything else, so there's no, I mean, that'll just happen to you naturally. Um, innovation stems from the fact that your biggest competition is going to be other companies trying to do something similar, just better than you, right? So you have to be able to innovate. I think the most famous example of this is Kodak, right? Kodak invented the digital camera. Right. They invented the digital camera, and then they didn't produce it because they were making so much money on film, such a killing on film and film development and everything else, that they couldn't afford to make the digital camera a reality. And then guess what happens? Now they're out of business because the digital camera came and went, and they were already behind the ball. Right? They were already behind the ball, and so they didn't make it. So remember that innovation, cannibalizing your own products, working through all of those things, is incredibly useful and incredibly powerful in maintaining your customers because your customers know when innovation is coming. Your customers can feel when innovation is coming because they're starting to see things crop up. Some guy is trying to sell a small digital camera for an exorbitant amount of money and so on and so forth, so it piques their interest over time. If you're not producing it, someone else will. That's just the reality, right? Okay. How's the stream doing? We're still dropping a lot of frames. Yeah, wow, we're dropping a whole buttload of frames. Yeah, it looks like my connection is just very unstable. Um, oh yeah, you're absolutely yeah, you're absolutely right, uh, dude. Arc twenty two. Self reflection is very difficult, but self reflection through action is actually a lot easier, right? When you when you take an action and then you, you get back some feedback. Once you've thought about all of the external factors that were there, what's left are your biases, right? So, so by process of elimination, you get to kind of look at yourself in that action. You get to decide why you made it and why you made that decision. And then hopefully learn from it and correct it. Um, you know, just like just like this Wi-Fi issue, which uh, stream quality is good right now. Okay, I'm glad it's good right now. I am, I am going to fix it uh, today. I'm, I'm literally just going to go to Staples and get whatever converter I need or anything. Um, and that's that. Okay, so entrepreneurs are associated with a lot of different things, right? So I'm not going to write these on the board because you probably know them, but fearlessness and idealism and optimism and grit and collaboration and, and all of these wonderful things. And I, I will tell you very seriously that once you commit, all of those things will come to you. The fearlessness, the grit, and everything else. Once you've made a commitment, a decision to keep going and to build something, to create something, to do something, you will find the strength within you for all of those things, right? It may take a while. It may take five businesses. It may take 10 businesses. It took me at least two companies, at least. And in my third company, I learned even more, right? So it takes a lot of work to get there. But when you do get there, when you do get there, the most important thing for an entrepreneur is avoiding burnout. Right. So burnout isn't burnout is a terrible thing. For those of you that experienced it in your work, 
in your lives, in, in whatever, burnout is a terrible thing. You begin to get angry. You begin to push people away, right? You begin to do all of these terrible things to people. Um, you begin to be self-destructive in your own life. You're tired. You're chronically fatigued. All of that stuff is happening to you all at the same time. So the way to avoid burnout is actually pretty simple. The first thing to do, and this is this is based both on personal experience and things that I've read and, and advice I've gotten from other entrepreneurs. The first thing you need to understand is that stress is rarely real. All right. Some people have nothing to eat in the morning. That's stress. Nothing to eat for lunch and no opportunity to get the food anywhere throughout the day. That's stress. That should stress you out. Some people go outside and have to wade through the marshes where there are tigers with a little mask on their back of their heads to scare them away, and they're basically playing like a one in ten shot of getting killed every day. That's stress, okay? Sitting in a cubicle is not stress, okay? So, first of all, eliminate any of the stress that is perceived by you as stress, that is relative to someone else who's I mean, obviously, yeah, taking the train is so stressful or driving to work because my CEO gets to fly in a helicopter. Yeah, I mean, I get it. It would be a lot easier to fly in a helicopter. But the reality is, I mean, imagine walking the 10 miles to work. That would be horrible. Now, that would be stress, right? You'd probably have to leave at some time at 3 o'clock in the morning. People have suffered through more, right? So take your stress, compartmentalize it, right? Decide what actually stresses you and what makes you uncomfortable or creates discomfort or, is, or isn't fun or isn't interesting and keep those things completely separate, right? Okay, that's the first thing. Second thing, and probably the most important thing, burnout is this is this word that, that I'm not sure what it's actually meant to mean in terms of its, its relationship to the real world, right? But what I'm gonna say is you need to fuel your engine. Or you need to fuel your car. Now think about it this way. If you're planning a road trip from point A all the way to point B, right? Oh, shit. B. B, B, B. Okay. All the way from point A to point B. And this whole road trip is 500 miles. Right? And you know that your car can go 250 miles without charging or without getting fuel or whatever, Right? If you are too far away from a gas station at mile 249 to get to one in one mile, your car is going to break down, okay? If instead of with gasoline, you filled your car engine with some water and some gasoline, your car is going to break down, right? If you've made any, if you put diesel in your car by accident, your car is going to break down and possibly even engulf in flames, right? So if you've done any of these things, you're not going to make it for your total 500 mile journey. And so what's important when you're an entrepreneur is that you refuel and fuel your car correctly, right? And this really, 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 truly incorporates not only your diet or exercise or meditation or any of that, and even your routines, but also, also the way that you treat so if you treat them as a chore and as something you just have to do, that's going to make them more difficult. But if you understand that these things are fueling your car and helping you avoid burnout, which is pretty terrible and dangerous, you're going to be more successful in your business and more able to sustain long, long work hours for a very long time. Right? So um, I recently, uh, recently, about two years ago, I ran a consumer product goods company. Um, we made manufactured yogurt and I'd have to do a lot of travel. So I spent uh, almost five months working 16 hour days. 14 to 16 hour days. Um, without my commute. And without, without considering flying or any of that. I didn't have weekends or anything like that. But I didn't burn out. And the reason I didn't burn out, I did, I did end up actually leaving, but the reason I didn't burn out was because all of the time that I had, I focused on optimizing my life and on making it simple. I wouldn't go grocery shopping. I would order it in, right? I wouldn't order in bad food. I'd order in something healthy that would fuel my body. Right? I tried to exercise. I tried to walk around. I tried to, tried to make sure that I was meeting new people and learning about new ideas and fueling my mind, right? 
All of those things keep your drive going. And that's very important when you're starting a company because starting a company can be pretty brutal, right? It can be pretty brutal and pretty demanding. And you're not going to want to, once you commit, you're not going to want to stop. You're going to want to keep going. You want to, you're going to want to have the strength to keep going. And to have the strength to keep going, you need to be, need to be avoiding burnout because it gets difficult. It's like, a, it's like having a baby. It's really like having a baby. Like you just, you care for this company and it's all weak and, and everything else, but it's important to take care of yourself and to make sure that you are equipped to succeed. All right. Now, finally, we'll talk about mentors and the importance of that, importance of that, legacy, the activity trap. Idea theft and just idea theft. Okay, so in the following lectures, we'll follow everything from accounting to starting a company to business ethics to making sure that you have enough pens and pencils and papers and all the supplies that you need, all of those things. And I'll try to go into as much depth as possible on each one so that you can get a real understanding. Truly, I would love for people to be able to watch this course and then go out and start a company. So the first thing we're going to talk about is mentors. Find them. Find them wherever you can for whatever area of life you can find them for. Find them and ask them questions. Schedule time to speak with them. This is perhaps the most powerful thing you can do, right? Because these people will give you advice. These people will help you along the way. These people will help you stay on track and to make the right decisions in difficult times. And they can make or break your work. So for mentors, find them. And don't be afraid to just ask. Most people want to be mentors. Most people want to help. Most people want to contribute, right? Consider that and remember it, right? Because think about it this way. If you succeeded, would you want to help? Would you want to give back? You would, right? And most people are just like you, right? So most people want to give back. So if you're opening a pizza shop, go drive 20 miles, find another pizza shop, walk in, talk to the owner and say, hey, I want to open a pizza shop in my neighborhood and I want to learn from you. I want to be able to talk to you once a month, just for 10 minutes, sit down, I'll buy you lunch, we'll talk about what's going on, we'll talk about some problems that I'm facing, and I hope I, that you can give me some advice. And if I can, I'll give you some back, right? So mentors, find them, and don't forget, always, always, always communicate with them and try to put something together. Your legacy, right? So this is the ultimate long-term perspective. Long-term perspective, okay. So if your perspective is on the short term, if you want to make $100 this week, are you worried about legacy? No. Are you willing to cheat? Maybe. Right? Are you willing to steal? Maybe. Right? Because you're worried about this week. Let's figure out this week and we'll move on to the next week. If you're worried about the next 10 years, it's maybe a little bit harder to do those things, but not towards the end of the 10 years. Right? If you're worried about the next 30 years, it's maybe even harder to do those things, but now you're worried about the very end. Right? When you worry about your legacy, when you think about what you're leaving behind on this planet, it puts and aligns your incentives in the right way, right? You don't want the legacy of the person that stole. You want the legacy, like, think about it this way. Who has a better legacy? Someone that stole a lot of money and cheated people and so on and so forth. Or someone that failed to make a lot of money but failed like 50 times in their lives and kept trying and kept sticking to their ideals. Who do you admire more, right? And remember that that's the legacy that you're building, right? Decide for yourself who you admire more and build that legacy because that's what's important. The activity trap is something that a lot of entrepreneurs get caught up in, and I must admit I have gotten caught up with in the past, is doing more doesn't actually produce more results. Sometimes working more is the worst thing that you can do, work less, right? So be really cognizant of why you're doing something and what you're trying to achieve, even with small tasks. Take the time, five minutes to so look at your tasks and say, okay, well, why am I trying to do this? What does this help? Oh, okay. Is that actually important? Okay. Maybe it is. Then do it. If it's not important, if it's not important right now, if it's not important in the next five minutes, the next step, don't do it. Skip it. Don't just do activity for the sake of activity. This is not a useful thing. No one's going to be impressed if you're working 25 hour weeks, right? I mean, 25 hour days or, <coughs> excuse me, or something more realistic, like 17, 18 hour days every day, right? That's kind of the trap that I got caught in, 
when I was doing 16 hour days. I thought more activity was better because I was compensating. I had never been in the consumer packaged goods industry, right? So I was compensating with my work ethic. But the reality is no one's going to be impressed if you're working that much. What people are going to be impressed with is results, right? So look for results, not activity. As a matter of fact, Lazy entrepreneurs tend to be the best entrepreneurs. I don't mean lazy like sitting on your couch doing TV all day. I mean lazy is in taking the shortest path to the best result possible, right? And the last thing is idea theft. So in a lot of these discussions and, and often when I discuss entrepreneurial ventures with people, I'm very open about my entrepreneurial ideas. I'm very open because idea theft is basically non-existent, right? I mean, you can you hear about like Zuckerberg and, and stuff like that and, and you know, for the most part, I think that scares a lot of people into sharing their ideas. The truth is, whatever idea that you have, two things, right? First of all, if it's such a simple idea that someone can steal it, it's probably a shitty idea, okay? That's the reality, right? If, if, if you're, you know, it's probably a gimmick or something like that, that you're just not thinking through all the way, and you've decided, that's it, I'm sorry, you know, I'm not going to share it with anyone, it's just going to be my secret. The second thing, you're not allowing your idea to flourish, to fill people's minds to get feedback on your idea, right? To bring more information in after doing so. And that also hurts you, right? That also hurts you. And that's a bad thing. That's a really bad thing. So it's important, it's important that rather than not share your ideas or have people sign special contracts that they won't tell anyone about your idea, share it. Share it openly. Because if someone finds the problem in your idea, they may have saved you years of time. And the reality is no one has the fucking time to go and make your idea their own. No one. And the truth is your inspiration for that idea, your drive to make that idea, they can't take that away from you. They can't. And even if they replicate it, they won't know where to take it. They won't know what the long run of this idea is. Right? So there's very little risk in sharing your ideas. So share them. Share them amongst each other, share them with your friends, share them however you want, but make sure that they're out there and that you're getting feedback and that you're getting excited because people will tell you if it's something that they're interested in. And if it's something that they're interested in, they're far less likely to be someone that steals your idea and far more likely to be your customer. All right, that's entrepreneurship and small business management, lecture one, and it's the third class now that I've taught on Twitch. Um, let's do like a five minute Q&A session and just to make sure you guys have any questions or anything like that. Let me switch scenes here. Let's do a five minute Q&A session. If you guys have questions, let me know. If not, that's also okay. Um, I know that the stream quality was not great. Yeah, it looks like we were dropping about 25%. <laughs> oh, Jesus. We were dropping about 25% before and about 15% after the restart. So. I'm going to go fix that right now. I'm going to go fix that and take care of it right now. Is there anything else? What did you guys think of the overall stream? Do you, are you guys interested in this class? Um, this is this is a, a new class separate from money and banking that I'm going to be trying to, um, well, I'm going to be running in the mornings uh, around this time. Does this time work for people? Oh, yeah, of course. Well, thank you for tuning in, man. This is This is a collaborative effort right the professor is not a professor without students right he's just some old guy in thick glasses um so yeah students students are pretty important and people learning and i'm glad i can bring people together to do something like this because it is a great opportunity to learn and i hope it really you know i hope it inspires a lot of people to go out and do something interesting you know build something that they believe in Thank you for tuning in, Touch Puppy Get Dizzy. Oh, if you guys haven't followed the stream, make sure you follow the stream. I'm still figuring out exact time slots over the next coming you know, couple of days, but I will be doing three streams a day. I've decided the three streams are going to be three different classes. So that way, if you're in a certain time zone and you can fit in, oh, okay, you're in the GMT time zone. This is perfect for you. Okay, so this is this is a good time zone for me too because I like getting a morning lecture out of the way. I'm thinking about doing morning I, in Easter time, afternoon, and then uh, a late night evening lecture, uh, because I usually teach at the university uh, in the evenings, two days a week, so I'll schedule something that happens maybe a little after that. So, yeah, 
Guys, don't forget to follow. I will start posting these on, on YouTube. I haven't really figured that out uh, in terms of, in terms of I, I know there's a way to automatically post stuff. I don't know if I have access to that yet because I'm not an affiliate or a partner. But I will start figuring out ways to post these on YouTube and hopefully annotate them and, and make sure that the, that the concepts and the content are easy to uh, to move through. I can watch the VOD after I miss it. Yeah, yeah, of course. No, you can always catch up with the VOD. Uh, that's always great. Also, don't forget, um, you know, I do these Q&A sessions. I'm thinking about doing like a maybe five, ten minute warm up before the class for Q&A as people file in. Um, so if you end up watching a VOD and you have a question about something that I said, feel free to write it down um, and then just put it in the chat during one of those warm-up sessions or one of these cooling off towards the end sessions uh, because then I'll be able to answer it and, and you know you still have access to me as an instructor. Right? I think that's I think that's very valuable in this in this Twitch environment is that I'm able to communicate with you guys and answer questions live, whereas a video really either covers something or it doesn't. Uh, so I would love I would love to help out with that kind of stuff. So if you do end up watching it later, um, just let me know. And I'd be happy I'd be happy to help out and answer any questions that you have. All right, guys, so it looks like that's it for questions. Um, I really appreciate you guys jumping in and, and being here this early in the morning. And, and to all of you who had to put up with the, with the jitteriness and, and poor stream quality, um, thank you for that because, uh, you know, that's just something we're, we're going to deal with in the beginning. But I'm going to try to get that resolved today. And, um, yeah, so I'll see you guys in the afternoon for another lecture. Uh, most likely money and banking this afternoon. And yeah, I'll, it's on my Twitter. I'll put it, I'll post it on my Twitter um, when I'm lecturing again. And so if you guys haven't followed me, it's, hold on, it's Dennis the Buff. Like that. Twitter.com slash Dennis the Buff. There you go. That's a link. Okay. So now you have the link. Um, and I'll tweet it out like five minutes before I start or a minute before I start or whatever. So I hope you guys can join me. And again, thank you so much for being here. I, I really do appreciate it. This, this is a really exciting time. All right, guys.